here for another episode of our Rational Wellness Podcast. It's confusing to know what you're supposed to do to be healthy. What should we be eating? How should we be exercising? Um, Should we be avoiding red meat, um, cheese, and butter? Should we be putting butter in our coffee? How should we be exercising? Should we be taking calcium supplements or are calcium supplements harmful? Should we take fish oils? Fish oil harmful. My goal is to bring clarity to some of these issues using the top scientific research and interviewing experts in the field who can help us understand some of these issues. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. So let's get started on your road to better health. The hope was so enticing back in the days. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you for joining me again today. You're in for a real treat. I'm very excited to be able to interview Dr. Isaac Elias today, who has some very interesting information to bring us about a protein in the body that's an inflammatory marker that you may not have heard of that's involved in a number of chronic diseases, including arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, and metastatic cancer. And Dr. Elias has developed a nutritional compound that can block and inhibit this inflammatory protein, thus halting the progression and even reversing uh, some of these um, incurable chronic diseases. Dr. Isaac Elias is an MD and an acupuncturist, and he's been a pioneer in the field of integrative medicine since the 1980s, with a specific focus on cancer, immune health, detoxification, and mind-body medicine. He's a respected formulator, clinician, researcher, educator, and author. Dr. Elias is directly involved in ongoing research and has published several peer-reviewed studies demonstrating the effectiveness of specific integrative therapies and nutraceutical formulations. He's the founder and medical director of Amitabha Medical Clinic (laughs) and Healing Center in Santa Rosa, California, where they offer individualized treatments and and care for cancer, Lyme, and other chronic diseases. Dr. Elias, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me. It's a real honor. It's, it's really a wonderful opportunity to, to do a podcast with you and to join your group in Los Angeles. I really enjoyed it. That's great. Um, can you tell us about this inflammatory protein in the body that plays a role in the development of so many chronic diseases that are the main source of, um, of problems for people today? <clears throat> Definitely. We, we all know that inflammation is a driving force for almost every chronic disease. And the process of, of inflammation is really like an orchestra playing together. The conductor of the orchestra is galactin-3. And while galactin-3 may not be known to many people, it is over 3,000 published peer review papers and every day more than one paper is published. So what is galactin-3? Galactin-3 is a lectin. It's a carbohydrate binding protein. And as such, it creates a central structure and what we call a lattice formation when it's stimulated. And on this lattice formation, (coughs) different inflammatory compounds, (coughs) growth factors sit on this formation and creates a coating, a film. And this coating helps to promote inflammation fibrosis, cancer growth, and metastasis. And so it has a very unique structure and it's needed in small amount in order to help us in injury repair. But when we have an injury, the repair mechanism, if it keeps on working, is through inflammation and fibrosis, which as we all know, it's really the driving force for all these chronic diseases. So when we understand and we find the conductor by blocking it or by removing it, we address so many other conditions. And that's the beauty of galactin-3. Interesting. So, you know, we know a lot about other inflammatory markers like CRP and the interleukins and TNF-alpha. How does galactin-3 
Um, what is its relationship with these other markers for inflammation? Actually, it's a great question, and I should have had the diagram right here. But if you, if you, if you imagine a square... Well, you know what? Provide me with the diagram, and I'll include it in the show oh, notes. Per perfect, perfect, I will. So if you look at the diagram, and you will see it, you will see that, for example, on the right upper hand of the diagram, there's a pathway to inflammation through interleukin-6, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, leads to infl inflammation, to tissue injury, and to fibrosis. And you will also see that in a similar process, there is a pathway to fibroblast stimulation, myofibroblast, and again, fibrosis, or through the TGF beta pathway. What stimulates this, what starts the whole cascade in the middle, is galactin-3. So galactin-3, when it's excreted, stimulates fibroblast and myofibroblast to cause fibrosis. But also when we have a trauma, an injury, even emotional, we'll have an excretion of galactin-3 that will stimulate the macrophage to turn into inflammatory macrophage. And this inflammatory macrophage is where this cascade of interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and TNF-alpha starts, starts rolling. So when we regulate galactin-3, we really regulate the different cascades, the inflammatory cascade, the extracellular matrix damage cascade, and the fibrotic cascade, which all lead to dysfunction. But when I talk about this, it's important to understand galactin-3 in the cell, intracellularly, has a very different role. It's in, it's, it's in, it's, it contributes to embryogenesis, to differentiation of tissues, to normalization in tissues. The problem comes when it's out of the cell, on the cell surface or in the circulation, that's where it becomes this really dangerous compound that instigates all these multiple diseases at such a wide variety of diseases. Interesting. Um, is collectin-3 inhibited by any inflammatory medications that are currently on the market or treatments such as NSAIDs or cortisone, NSAIDs include, um, uh, those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for the listeners like um, ibuprofen, cortisone, or even therapeutic modalities like ultrasound. Um, is galactin-3 affected by any of these? No, none of these affect directly galactin-3. If we change our lifestyle, for example, and we become less inflamed, we sleep more, we eat better, we exercise, we relax, our inflammation in the body goes down, then naturally there will be less of galactin-3. But it's really, galactin-3 has to be inhibited very specifically, and I will provide you, of course, a diagram of galactin-3 so people will understand. But when you look at the diagram, you will see that it has like a handle, which is the antibody part, the amino acid, and it has this almost like, like a hole for a key, which is a carbohydrate recognition domain. So when the inflammatory compounds come in into this socket, a single galactin-3 turns into a pentamer. And that's how the pentamers attach to each other. And you get this, this coating that, for example, then will surround the immune cells and stop excretion of cytokines that will allow the cancer cells to hide from the immune system, that will propagate inflammation and fibrosis kidney damage, congestive heart failure, and sometimes to an extreme, there are certain medical conditions where the outcome, depending on the levels of galactin-3 in the blood, is dramatically different. You know, you just mentioned uh, conditions like chronic kidney disease and aortic uh, stenosis, which is where the uh, valve, the aortic valve gets calcified, becomes fibrotic. These are, you know, chronic conditions that there's really no cure for. And basically, patients get managed, but they inevitably go downhill fairly rapidly. Exactly. Is, is, is this something that could actually be affected by interfering with collectin-3? <clears throat> yes. And uh, so if we look, I, I've developed the only commercially available galactin-3 blocker with the beauty of it. It's a natural product. It's a very specific, sophisticated modification of pectin, which is a long chain of carbohydrate of galacturonic acid, which is present in different fruits. This is specifically from citrus. 
and it's important to clarify that modified citrus pectin is really a generic name because every pectin has to be extracted. But my specific modified citrus pectin, pectasol C, that's the one modified citrus pectin that all the research has been conducted, close to 40 published papers. So if we look at the effect of modified citrus pectin, for example, I think there are about 10 published papers and every two, three weeks, another paper is being published specifically on its effect on inflammation and fibrosis. So we've seen multiple animal studies that when you take, for example, rats that have a, that you feed them a certain diet or they have a tendency to develop arteriosclerosis, heart failure, kidney damage, and you compare it to rats without, without galactin-3, they don't get a disease. But when you give mod our modified citrus pectin to these rats, you reverse the condition. Now, this is published in the best journal, in American Heart Association journals. It's, it's much bigger than my work now. You know, it's research all over the world. But we are now at the latest stages of studying patients with hypertension, double-blind clinical trial in Harvard, where patients have galactin-3 above 17.8. And I want the audience to remember the number 17.8. And we want to see if we, it's a double blind and it's going to finish in February after four, four years, again, done in Harvard MGH. And we want to see if by giving mod, our modified citrus pectin, we can change the tendency for these hypertensive patients to move into congestive heart failure. Why is this so important? Because if we look at congestive heart failure, which is a very common disease, and we look at the levels of galactin-3, so the one that are under 17.8, this is a study on 582 people. If you're under 17.8, in one year, all-cause mortality is 12.5%. If you are over 25.9, not such a huge difference, overall mortality in one year only is 37%, three times wow. in one year. Crazy. Why? Because the galactin-3 contributes to what we call ejection fraction preserved congestive heart failure. When the heart doesn't just get big and you can still help it to contract, the heart becomes stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. So it's still contracting, but the volume of contraction goes down and down, and there is no treatment to this kind of congestive heart failure. But this is the mechanism that will make a chronic kidney disease patient regress much quicker into dialysis, that's the mechanism that we will see in cancer patients becoming much more aggressive or metastasizing. And we have the data, you know, we just, we just presented it in, in our abstract was just presented at the most important oncology conference and we are submitting a, a, another one now, showing that, for example, in patients whose prostate was taken out and there is no PSA, now PSA starts coming back, meaning it's directly from the cancer. Then we look at PSA doubling time. How fast is the PSA going up? The faster it goes, the quicker the cancer is progressing. And we expect 80% 80 80 of the people for the pace to get faster and faster. We showed that we slow down or stop the progression in 80% of patients. This is our third clinical trial, repeating the same results. This is on 40 people. It's very significant. Very well done. It's a stage 2B, 3A FDA approved trial from the quality. So we are seeing these results in cancer. We are getting data. You know, we are studying in osteoarthritis right now. We are studying it again with, uh, with Harvard. They are, and now it's a place where the NIH is funding studies. Uh, Harvard is funding studies. You know, it's, uh, it's at the stage where now... Uh, we, you know, we usually say in, in, in alternative medicine, first they ridicule you then they fight you, and then they say it's self-evident. So now a galactin-3 and blocking galactin-3 is self-evident, and if this was a drug, it would have been a multi-billion dollar drug, but it's, as I say, it's really the gift from nature, something so simple like a sophisticated modified pectin, which is again produced so it can be, it can be reproduced, that somebody can take at a level of five grams a day, for prevention up to 10, 15 grams a day in cancer really yields results that the data is uh, so solid, you know, close to 40 published papers. I mean, this is really amazing. I don't know if people 
understand how significant this potentially is. You're talking about diseases that right now we can only manage. You, you're talking about atherosclerosis. You can give patients statins, you can give them other drugs, and all that does is slow down the progression of the atherosclerotic process. None of those drugs have been shown to reverse atherosclerosis. You have a patient with um, um, you know, a heart failure, as you're talking about, and you know, these patients get loaded up with drugs and it slows down the progression, but none of those drugs reverse the process and all those patients inevitably either die or end up with uh, you know, a heart replacement. All these conditions that you're talking about, metastatic prostate cancer, there's really no cure for that. You know, the most you can do is maybe slow it down. So this is really, really exciting that we may have a, a, an ability to reverse some of these chronic processes. Of course, and uh, one of our challenges, because uh, you can see the clinical trials, uh, if phase three is on prostate cancer, a double-blind clinical trial is on hypertension and congestive heart failure. Another trial is on osteoarthritis. I mean, you can see the, just the spread of the data, and it's actually a challenge with the medical establishment because doctors are so used to, there is one drug for congestive heart failure, right. one drug for cancer, one drug for, for arthritis. So it's, it's challenging to educate them a lot with the modified cytospectin, but also I'm doing very interesting research in our clinic. We have a, a big center for therapeutic apheresis where we remove inflammatory compound through blood filtration. It's a sophisticated treatment that classically, again, is used for people with genetic hypercholesterolemia, but we use it for inflammatory condition. And I'm developing a column that specifically will remove galactin-3 with very promising results in large animal studies. And we are, but even there, when we talk to the NIH, when we talk to collaborator, we have so many choices, and you know, it's hard to really pinpoint one for for FDA approval, for example, but in the field of dietary supplement, you know, I started this journey with modified citrus pectin in 1995. And it's a great story, Ben, and actually I would like to share it. So Thank in you. 1971, I was 12 years old and native of Israel, and my mother and I took a walk to, to the Cohen, to Ruth and Leo Cohen, which were both PhDs in organic chemistry and pioneers in the citrus industry. And Ruth, out of the blue, turned to me and said, Isaac, one day they will find a cure for cancer from the peel of the citrus fruit. And 24 years later, when the first study came by Avram Raz, which really, in, really deserves the credit, he found lectins, he started this, and we are actually working together. He really made such a contribution. Then I called her up, I told her, this 12 years old kid remembered the thing. I called her, I told her, Ruth, I'm calling you from San Francisco. I remember what you told me, and here is the study. I need your help. And that's how my journey started. And while I did this and researched this, it was very important for me as a researcher and ethically to keep objective. So in my clinic, which uses a lot, a lot of sophisticated method, modified citrospectin was one of the supplements, not the first on the list. But I can tell you now with the research, I strongly feel it's the most important supplement that people need to need and have to take, even five grams a day. I see it in how it makes Lyme patients get better. I see it in, I see, I see it in a wide array of conditions. I have such extensive experience treating thousands of people and looking at the levels of galactin-3. And in the same time, Ben, it's like a mystery unfolding. We now find out that there is a dynamic relationship between monomers and pentamers in the blood that balances itself. There's a lot to learn, but what is without doubt, we see every day getting stronger and stronger. When you use something like modified citrospectin, when you block galactin-3 in the blood, you are definitely contributing to your, to your longevity and to preventing illnesses and diseases. And it's really, it's really incredible, it's so, it's so simple. You know, I, I imagine that you're going to get a significant amount of pushback from uh, Big Pharma. I was just reading a, a, a paper last week about some new uh, cardiovascular drug that um, is to prevent heart disease by reducing inflammation, and it only costs $200,000 a year. 
it, it could have been 250. <laughs> but you know, what a bargain. But actually, it's really interesting. We are one level we are getting push from Big Pharma, and one level we are getting collaborations in Big Pharma. No, Big Pharma is very interesting. It has this big, monstrous money effect on us. But inside Big Pharma, there are good scientists who actually want to do good. It's really interesting. I was just in a conference and I met with some from a very large pharma, Big Pharma, good people. They are part of the system, it's true. And if you can get $200,000, why, why would you sell it for $50,000? <laughs> no, it's true. And it's definitely, I mean, we can see it. You know, we can see it in our field. There's a lot of pressure on people like me. But hopefully I'm getting to the tipping point where I have so many studies. So I decided consciously when I started this to just focus on research and focus on research and focus on research. And now that we are producing so much research, I mean, no one can come and say this is, this is, this is not uh, validated in research. But in the same time, every day I deal with researchers. I try to start other research projects. I just got an amazing email 10 minutes ago. We are starting a phase one trial on PD-1 inhibitors in cancer with our modified citrus pectin, because the PD-1, the checkpoint inhibitors that we were so excited about cause extreme inflammation and the results are not what we wanted. And we know by the mechanism, the reason for this is galactin-3 and there's already preliminary data. So we're getting this kind of studies happening or oh, my galactin-3 column in, in chronic kidney disease and uh, it, it's exciting. You, you just hopefully I'll be healthy enough and I can keep going. So do you think there's enough data right now to give a relatively strong recommendation to a, uh, a cardiologist or other doctor managing a patient with chronic kidney disease that, uh, go, that modified citrus pectin should be part of the treatment program? I think we are getting close to it. You know, doctors are a very astringent uh, because... For doctors to recommend, it needs to become a standard of care. But I think for doctors who think more out of the box, of course, and it's happening. I mean, I mean we have to understand the, the, the more sophisticated cardiologists are extremely interested in, in galactin-3 and in modified citrus pectin. The study on Harvard was created from the initiative of Harvard Cardiologists, it wasn't even our initiative. They just used our compound. Same right. with osteoarthritis, you know. Uh, you know, the cancer study, I was more involved. I'm, I'm the last author of a, of a multiple uh, a, a center, and Dr. Daniel Katzman is an amazing Euro, Euro general oncologist, kind man and brilliant, and he's heading the study. And he, he was so interesting to look at him. He said, look, I don't know if it's going to work. I have to be skeptical, but I'm, I look at the data and I want to try. And he really tried, you know, open-minded. His open-mindedness as a conventional oncologist makes most of us integrative doctors pale. But he was really open to try, you know. Right. To remember, as alternative people, we have to be open to try things that we don't always believe in. And sure enough, he just said, you know, he said, we have 41 patients. He just wrote me, he said, you know, it's amazing. The results are just amazing. Wow. And, uh, it, 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 it's probably the case, I'm sure it's the case that um, doctors who utilize modified citrus pectin in some of these conditions like kidney disease or, or heart failure, that uh, at worst, if it doesn't work, it's going to be very safe, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> it's an extremely safe compound and it really needs to be, all of us have inflammation. You know, we have a number of studies showing how modified citrus pectin pulls out heavy metals. And we know the mechanism. The beauty about this is that it's not like a mistake. You know, many drugs are found by mistake. We know the mechanism. We understand how it pulls out heavy metals. We understand how it will enhance the immune system. And we published on it. We understand how it will prevent the arteriosclerotic plaque and prevent the, the fibrosis. We understand how it will create anti-angiogenesis because VEGF is sitting right here on the CRD. And if you take it out, you stop the there's a process. So we are doing studies with the understanding of the mechanism of action. So what's really unique with this, which is a little bit my life story, that it's highly, it's highly research-based. 
we understand the mechanism, yet it's from the peel of the citrus fruit. It can't be much more natural than this, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. So a unique combination. What kind of dosage would you use for some of these conditions? So usually, you, you, you can check your Galactin-3 level. It's an FDA right. approved test. It's paid by every insurance company, especially if your doctor puts the right, the right codes. So if you're gonna, now, in, and this is why I mentioned the 17.8. In the general population, the average levels of Galactin-3 are around nine. Very low. There's a large study on 8,000 people, it's called the Firmingham Offspring Study, a famous epidemiological study, 8,000 people. And it showed that when you follow these people for 11 years, based on their baseline, the lowest 40% that were 7.7 .7 and 9.1, compared to the highest 20%. So the highest 20% of the population was only 15.6, much lower than 17.8. But the people at 15.6, compared to the lowest 40%, had three times all-cause mortality over 10, 11 years. Wow. So, so if you don't check your Galactin-3 levels and you are really healthy, just take five grams a day. It's enough. If your Galactin-3 is over 14 and you are healthy, go up to 10 grams. If it's over 17.8, go to 15 grams a day because you got to block more Galactin-3. And then if you have fibrotic or heart conditions, or if you have cancer, then the dosages naturally go up. So if you have a fibrotic disease, and I'll give you a chart for this. If, 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 you, if you have a fibrotic disease, then if you're over 12, you'll already take 10 grams. If you have active cancer, regardless of the concentration, and I don't have time to explain why, you take 15 grams a day while you're dealing with the disease and for a few years afterward. And then, you start going down. And we have now substantiation for this, for this, uh, for the value of this. Now you talked about um, using uh, modified citrus pectin for Lyme disease, um, which is, you know, a chronic immune condition. Um, can't, and, and I noticed that in some of your data, um, modified citrus pectin upregulates T cells and B cells and natural killer cells. What about for autoimmune conditions where the immune system maybe is too revved up, is, is this something that could be helpful or should it be avoided? Very helpful. Because if you look at autoimmune diseases, the patients have very high level of galactin-3, sometimes the highest, because it produces inflammation and fibrosis. And the galactin-3 will downregulate TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, which is what driving so it has a very big role in, 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 in autoimmune diseases. It produces tolerance when you have too much inflammation going on. Huh. So it, it regulates the system. That's the beauty of this regulatory a, a product, a, a protein, which is at the middle of the, of the cascade. So definitely autoimmunity is one of the main indications for the use of, uh, of modified citrus. So it's beneficial. Does it increase T regulatory cells? You know, it does. It, 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 it does increase and regulate T cells. It also allows them to function better, which, 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 which we have shown in studies. But in Lyme disease, it plays another important role. And that's why in Lyme disease, the unique thing is that now that there are more doctors using it, interesting, we can hear that they are, they are reporting that whatever program they are giving, the program is better. It gets improved. And one interesting symptom is that the pain of the patients get better because of the regulation of the inflammation. But the key reason for using modified citrus pectin in Lyme disease is that the biofilm, the microbiome, the biofilm where different parasites and, and the, and the tick-borne uh, infections are sitting, it's made out of galactin-3. It's a bone structure of galactin, then glycolipid, glycoprotein, oxidized uh, phospholipids are sitting on this structure. So when you use modified citrus pectin, you break the biofilm, and it was shown that galactin-3 blocks the ability of antibiotics to fight infection, that bacteria of different kinds use galactin-3 to hide, and modified citrus pectin, our modified citrus pectin has a number of publications as a, as a prebiotic. 
is wow. regulating and helping the process. And in fact, I'm speaking at ILEDS in November this year about the use of, of about the role of galactin-3 and modified titus pectin specifically for Lyme disease based on the microbiome and biofilm. What about uh, a very common GI condition that a lot of us see, which is irritable bowel syndrome, which is often or caused by small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And a as a chiropractic uh, functional nutritionist like myself, you know, we often use uh, natural antimicrobials to try to get at these uh, um, you know, bacterial overgrowth, and, and they're often difficult to eradicate. Um, and we believe this is partially due to biofilms that make it difficult to get at. Is modified citrus pectin something that could be used as a part of a treatment protocol for a patient with SIBO? Yes, so the SIBO patients can really benefit from modified citrus pectin because of the ability to peel off. So what happens, here is the beauty of this. So you, you are breaking down the biofilm. When you break down the biofilm, which often is negatively charged, there are heavy metals and oxidized lipids that are sitting there. Modified citrus pectin is a powerful chelator of lead and mercury and cadmium. We, we, it's well known. We have published clinical trials on this. So you have something that is breaking the biofilm, and in the same time, it's binding to the biotoxin, to the neurotoxin, to the mold toxins, and to the heavy metals. And I think, Ben, that's why the Lyme doctors are reporting if I start it before I start my antibiotic therapy, my patients do better. If I add it to my natural regimens, my patients do better. And we can understand why, because galactin-3 is the center of this extracellular attempt of the body to repair itself unsuccessfully. I see. So we can use it in place of clay or other natural binding agents that some of us will use. Or you can combine it if you want. You know, it's very using the gut to use with alginate, with seaweed, with, and you know, with, with, with chlorella for people who use, or use it with pharmaceutical chelating agents for people who can use them. Like, but, like but the oral safe. agents, like DMSA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it's very safe. We have shown that modified citrus pectin does not deplete the body from essential minerals. It does not. We have published on it two papers looking at another, but. It has a much greater affinity for the heavy metals. I like the image of like a sip of gold. You know, when you look in the river and the gold is the heaviest, it goes to, to, to the bottom. That's kind of, it. it has this much greater affinity for lead, for cadmium, for, and, and mercury, for arsenic, for uranium. We're about to study, to, to publish a case report of a family with elevated uranium where, where our MCP alginate combination made a difference. Interesting. So you use a combination of MC uh, modified citrus pectin and alginate? Yes, we actually have a specific product that has this combination. That oh, really? Have. And so that's specifically for heavy metal chelation? And the idea is that, and if somebody has elevated galactin-3, they may need to take extra MCP. The modified citrus pectin, which we have now shown, we developed an antibody for modified citrus pectin, and we proved that it gets absorbed into the bloodstream, which is a big deal. We know the half-life, which nobody knew until few months ago. So the modified citrus pectin has a systemic chelating effect. The alginate will bind in the gut and will prevent the reabsorption and offer a wider profile, right, of biotoxin. So when you use them together, you need a lower dose if the issue is specifically just heavy metals. So you will take like three capsules twice a day of the MCP alginate will be enough. Huh, that's a relatively low dosage. Yes, just because when we've shown pe pe people feel better, inflammation goes down. But if you have elevated levels of, of galactin-3, then you will also add another 5 or 10 grams of just modified citrus pectin. Interesting. And, and so that you found to be an effective protocol for a patient with elevated um, mercury or lead? Or... Yes. I mean, lead is very tricky because lead is in the bones. And we don't realize that our bones can literally be taken over by lead. And uh, it can take years, but we looked at lead in the blood in, uh, in, in children with toxic lead levels in China. We published on seven cases, seven children, and it was dramatic. Their blood levels were reduced to you know, like p-value was 0 0.00001 or 0.007. And so level in the blood dropped and excretion in the urine 
increased very dramatically. But lead is tough. Lead, we are, I am very passionate about lead because in the inner city and in many, you know, there are many Flint, Michigans. There are hundreds yeah. of Flint, Michigans. And we, I have a foundation, a Mitava Wellness Foundation, that originally used to be called the Our Kids Sake because it was focused just on homeless children. Now we call it Amitaba Wellness Foundation. Amitaba means in Sanskrit, limitless light. It still supports children, but it also promotes meditation and healing. And one of our projects is that for years we tried to place water filters in the homeless shelters because we know about the problem. You know, there are places in this country, in big cities, where you have six, seven, eight parts per million of lead in the water, 100% wow. absorption. And you know, we worry about Proposition 65, lead in herbs. They are bound to the herbs. They're not going to release. It's not an issue. It's when it's in the water that it's an issue. And, you know, it goes through. So I think lead has such damaging effect, especially for children, you know, developmental issues, personality issue, IQ, and then chronic diseases. So, you know, we got to do what we got to do to help. And, and this is really just because there's lead pipes, right? I mean, those can be replaced. Why aren't we doing that? It's crazy. Exactly. Yeah. You know, ounce of prevention goes a long way, but you don't always, when there's no disease, nobody wants to prevent. It's, uh, it's like global warming, right? <laughs> we don't want to prevent, then we get a hurricane and it costs us like prevention for 20 years. Exactly, exactly. But it's the same philosophy. I think that the medical philosophy is a reflection of who we are and how is the society now. Yeah, it's where the incentives are, you know? Exactly. Right so, now, there's no incentives built into the medical system for the insurance companies to worry about uh, spending money now that'll save them money, you know, 15, 20 years down the road because all they're concerned about is maximizing their profit so that, you know, their share price goes up so the CEO can get a uh, bonus. I mean, the share price is the issue, but there are now more sophisticated models and even insurance companies, for example, in our work with the Galactin 3 aphorisis, we can show that over a 10 year period, it's much cheaper than getting them into dialysis and it is getting the attention. So at some point we'll have to do something about it. Just like we'll have, if not too late, do something about the environment. But I really think it's like, uh, you know, there's a saying in Hebrew, you help one person at a time, one person. Yeah. And so hopefully we can help some more with this podcast. But uh, it's, really, it's really remarkable how nature gave us this unbelievable compound. It's really, really, I mean, Ruth Cohen, how did she know about it? It was like an, an, an insight, you know, and it stuck in my mind somehow. Did you, how did you come to test this compound in the first place? Or did somebody, was somebody else testing mod modified yeah. citrus pectin? There was a paper in 1995 that was published in Journal of National Cancer Institute that modified it with pectin prevented, in mice who were injected prostate cancer to the hip, it prevented lung metastasis dramatically. There was no compound natural or drug at that time. And it kind of like passed by and I was just blown away, you know? Wow. So the whole project around it. And here I am, you know, 22 years later with some gray hair <laughs> and still breathing. And, uh, you know, and we haven't even started Touching the, the depths of it, and honestly, I've never imagined it would be such a big thing. I don't think anybody did. I just wrote Avram Raz, you know, a few weeks ago, I told him, Avram, I mean, did you ever imagine, I mean, 25 years ago that this is going to be this way? I mean, it's unbelievable. Is he the one who wrote that paper? Yeah, he was the last author, and now we are, we are, we were doing some, some work together and collaborating. And so, does he have his own version of modified situation? No, 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 no. He is, he is, is, is working with us. Oh, okay, great. You know, he's collaborating with us on research. And, but yeah, then he, then he told me, you know, that, that's what gets me. I know he's not very young, you know, the professor in Wayne State. And he said, that, that's what gets me up every morning. You know, it was really admirable that knowing that his work is helping people and I really respect him for this. And, that's really amazing. And, and thank you so much, Dr. Elias, for bringing this information to the world because this is such an important uh, discovery. And um, now, showing the scientific um, validity of it is so important because chronic diseases are this 
what's costing our mm-hmm. our country you know the major cause of uh, disease and death today and and is bankrupting our healthcare system so using natural compounds and approaches like this that, that can prevent and reverse these chronic diseases is, is really amazing. Yeah, and you know, and again, a lot of great people that are helping, but if people want more information, they can go to modifiedcitruspectin.org where we have more information about modified citrus pectin or go to Dr. Elias, dreliasorg and they can get more information. And uh, yeah, definitely. That's great. You know, I was, I was just getting to the close of our discussion here and I was going to ask you what's the best way for people to get in touch with you. Is there any final thoughts you want to tell our viewers and listeners? I think that it's really, I mean, <clears throat> I feel honored being part of this journey and I really, rec- really want to recommend people, especially doctors. And really, people say, oh, you know, you, you develop this. But really, even if I did not develop this unrelated, put all your patients on modified citrus pectin. Take at least five grams a day. You know, it's not expensive at five grams a day. And it will really, really, really make, make a difference. It's, you know, one thing we didn't mention, when we look at aging. Yeah. So, for example, and final thought, and a little bit going back, if you look at right. aging, and you look at galactin three levels, it's yeah. experience. People above 100 compared to healthy controlled 70 or 80. The people who made it to 100 have much lower levels of galactin three in the blood than the ones who are 70, 80, who including them, the ones who are going to make it to 100. So we know when you block galactin three, it's an anti-aging treatment. And, and you know, it, and you, you, it just, it's this ongoing inflammatory compound which is really an expression of our lifestyle now for all of us. And in addition to trying to change our lifestyle, it's so simple, you know, it comes in a lime taste or, or just without lime or in capsules, and it's really easy to take. And it's remarkable, you know, people want to find, also people can also call if they want 1-800-308-5518, 1-800-308-5518, and uh, people want to find me personally about our phoresis, they can go to Amitabha Clinic that, that old. So the phoresis uh, treatment is now available? Not the one that removes galactin-3. Okay. But we use the existing aphoresis treatment and we use them in different conditions in cancer and inflammation. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Elias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.